Good morning. Today's scripture reading is going to be Luke chapter 23, verses 18 through 25. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man, release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found him in no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him punished and released. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant them their demands. He released the man who had been thrown into the prison for insurrection and murder, the one they had asked for, and surrendered Jesus to his will. The topic today, <clears throat> excuse me, did Jesus die upon the cross? There are two questions I want to answer, not from the secular viewpoint, although we will use archaeology and history, <clears throat> but to people that call themselves Christians. Many don't believe he died on the cross. The second is many don't believe that he was on a cross. So I want to pose those two areas, look at archaeological evidence, but also the Bible and what's going on here. But first of all, <clears throat> this rendition of items not found in the bulletin. Many thought that John Thompson was going to be speaking today because he hadn't spoken for quite a while. Well, I'm glad you will notice that I got the better looking one up here in front rather than John. At least that's what Becky tells me. John Thompson, those you don't know, graduated from Muleshoe High School. So we can say he's definitely a card-carrying mule. The picture you see at the bottom is the mascot. I was fortunate enough to find John's ID in high school. I'm not sure what it looks like now. You can see from the picture he definitely assimilated into the board. That might be a good picture to put into the directory, by the way. John, in his own mind, thought he was a very good athlete. <clears throat> he left Muleshoe High School and went to Abilene Christian to play football. Not just to play football, but to focus on being the first left-footed kicker for the Dallas Cowboys. But alas, over time, with dwindling success, he realized <laughs> that Abilene Christian only used right-footed footballs. So the question I'm asking you today, did Jesus die on the cross? Did he die? Evidence is there for us that there should not be any discussion at all, but yet there is discussion in, among Christians that that point never was reached. <clears throat> A few years ago, before I retired from ASU, we're getting ready to do some research on on autistic children in Scottsdale. And my student was with me doing the research, started telling me about her grandmother who had died the last year, <clears throat> and her family searched for signs that would show that her mother was grandmother was in heaven and that all of her religious beliefs could be verified through fact. I asked a question concerning faith. What is faith? but her faith had to be drawn upon fact. Now, we as Christians have a different call. And you see through Paul, two points I'm going to raise here, first one in 2 Corinthians, we walk by what? Faith, not by sight. <clears throat> in other words, the Bible is full. We believe the Bible is full. It's complete. It's perfect. Taking things out of it and putting things into it mar the perfection. Also, Paul in 2 Timothy said, be diligent to present yourselves approved of God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. In other words, understanding what's going on. Accurately handling, or you might see dividing, the word of truth. 
that Bible is our main focus. <clears throat> but at the same time, is it wrong to look at archaeology? Is it wrong to look at history to add some of the, the facts into this? And the answer is no, categorically. So I want to bring a little bit of that history to these two questions, did he die and did he die on the cross? The cross is mentioned 149 times in the New Testament. If it's not important, it would not be in the Bible that much. Crucifixion is written 43 times in the New Testament. So we know the cross is extremely important to us and to also for Christians. So let's look at the, some of the controversies. The first one we'll take is, did he die on the cross? Not just in the secular world, but I'm talking about Christians here. Many Christians don't believe he died on the cross at all. Many are still struggling with the idea that it happened at all. In fact, they're trying to use history and also the secular research to prove that there was not a situation like this. Those are people that call themselves Christians. I don't know if you know about this. The swoon hypothesis I thought was debunked. The swoon hypothesis was driven by Christians trying to explain this and said that Christ didn't die on the cross. He actually fainted. And he fainted in such a deep stance that the Romans thought he was dead, pulled him off the cross before he died, put him into the tomb. He woke up and left. And that explains the resurrection. These are Christian people who have that tag. Obviously, the whole area is wrong. If we look at the history of research, the Romans were extremely explicit about what to do about the, the crucifixions. They had an executioner that was taught how to extend the misery of the people on the cross. They got together in conventions to share information about how to do this, but to make sure that person died an agonizing death, but the key was death. If we look at the Bible and use that as a reference, in John 19, verse 33 and 34, it says that the Romans came by. Jesus was dead on the cross. They knew he was dead on the cross. They did not break his legs, which is going to be critical for us a little bit later in our discussion. And a soldier pierced his side with the lance. What came out? Blood and water. When the heart stops beating, pathologists will tell us that the weight of the erythrocytes, the red blood cells, are drawn toward the extremities. Jesus is in an upright position. That means the red blood cells are going to move toward the bottom. We don't know the percentages of blood and water, but a good guesstimate would be after 10 minutes, his last beat of the heart, this is where they pierced his side. That would mean the blood and water came out. If he was still alive, if the swoon hypothesis was correct, when they pierced his side, guess what would happen? you'd have a lot of flow of blood because every pulse would push the blood out. Categorically, the swoon hypothesis does not fit in any of the research we have in our pathology and our medicine, et cetera. But it's still debated on a yearly basis. Sad part, Christians trying to explain this. So we can say categorically at this point, we believe that Jesus died on the cross. Evidence is there. Let's look at some of the secular history we have. The gentleman you have at the top is Josephus. <clears throat> look at his writings here. And he wrote in Testonium, the uh, articles or antiquities of the Jews, about 63 years after Christ died, that Pontius Pilate sanctioned the crucifixion. It's very interesting because he uses a uh, pronoun, we pushed Pontius Pilate to sanction the crucifixion. Who's we? He was too young to be part of the Jewish leadership, but he was saying that the Jewish leadership was in charge or fully responsible for that. Again, filling very long with the Bible. Now there's been some, some pushback about uh, some of the data in there and some of the uh, edits that maybe the Christians did. So let's look at another person and say, we know categorically this individual did not have anybody tank, uh, uh, move through his literature. This is Tacitus. Tacitus was the most renowned German uh, Roman uh, historian. He wrote about 20 years after Josephus and it's called the Annals. Here's a Roman senator, a Roman historian, telling about the first uh, century church. He said, categorically, Pontius Pilate sanctioned the death of the crucifixion of Christ, called the Christ. 
So we have secular information to show this happened. It happened with Pontius Pilate, and it also fits the New Testament scriptures. Categorically, we believe that he died on the cross. So that's the first question answered. We should know that Jesus died on the cross. So what archaeological evidence is there about crucifixion? And I'll be honest with you, very little. It's very scant. So I'll give you the four. There's only four archaeological sites ever been excavated that <clears throat> show any history of the crucifixion. You've got to realize that's almost a millennial that crucifixions have been going on almost a thousand years from the Persians on and only four sites. Here are the four sites. Two of them are in Italy. One, the first one, the 2007, was in southern Italy. 2018 was in the Po Valley, northern Italy. The 1968 was in Jerusalem. The latest one was in Britain. It was actually excavated in 2017. There was so much mud around the ankle bone, they didn't realize that there was a, a nail through it until two years later. It was released in 2019. So we'll look at some of the evidence. The question is, why only four archaeological sites. The answer is these individuals are put on a cross were the most despised individuals that Rome could see. After they put them on the cross and humiliated them all the way through, the last part of humiliation was they did not bury them. They took the body and threw them in the dump so that all the animals could eat them. That's why there's very little evidence anymore. These four were buried. We don't know why, but they were buried. And that's what gave us the information coming back and looking at it. So the question that the last question we want to deal with here, which I'm going to spend most of the time in this discussion, was it a pole or was it a Christ, a cross? Was it a beam or did it have what we'll call a transom or a patabulum top part on it? The argument has been for a long time. There's one major group that poses that. I remember talking to Dieter last year, and Dieter had a situation, he was talking to a woman that believed this, and he was befuddled trying to talk to her about the cross because her opinion was here. The argument originally had three main points. There's a fourth one that's been added with the archaeology, and I'll deal with that in just a second. Their first point is that the cross weighed over 300 pounds. It would be very difficult for an individual to go through all the beating, carry the cross, even on a flat surface, much less uphill. They pose that because they believe the whole cross was movable. That's not archaeologically correct. So let's look at a little bit of what's going on at the time. The average height of a Roman citizen in Christ's time was about five foot five inches tall. The average Jewish man was five foot one inches tall. This bioarchaeologist, uh, I was reading her work, she is doing the excavation of the Roman gladiators. And she, in her text, said that the average height was five foot three inches tall. For every Roman gladiator, about five foot three inches tall. I thought, how sad that is for a cub to be born 2,000 years after that. He could have walked among the giants. So the first point, I want to look at it and give you a picture here of what we see with the archaeology. Number one, as you see a picture on the left-hand side, of an individual, obviously that's Christ's rendition of what they believe Christ looked like, that the top member, the transom or the patabulum, is tied to that individual, not the whole cross. The beam was fixed in the ground, was not movable. The top piece was put onto it. So you can see on the far right-hand side where the sign would be, and then this looks like. So the cross and most of the archaeological evidence is not like we have it, it's the T. So we're going to have some, some uh, new words we need to look at. One is horn. In the old uh, language, horn meant point. So when you see this about the four horns or five horns, it means five points. At the bottom of that cross, I want you to focus on something. You see a little pedal? It's called a pedile. This is where the feet were, were fixed to the cross. Most evidence showed that the two feet were parallel that there were two nails used, and the nails went through the feet into that piece. I'll show you more data later. So the patabulum is the piece that comes across. So the crux is the, the, the beam, and the patabulum or transom is the top part. 
So the cross mover was in the ground. It was fixed. Only thing movable was the transom. So we need to change our ideas of what was going on to look in archaeology. The top is that idea that the whole cross was movable. That's not the case. In fact, you'll see the feet around the side displayed. I'll show you a little bit about the evidence on that. I don't believe that Christ was that way, but I believe that most crucifixion was that way. So the bottom is how archaeologists look at it now, that the transom was carried, put on the top of the cross, they were crucified at that point. Totally different than what you have as far as some of the history. So let's look at the second part. That should uh, answer the question first, that there was 300 pounds carried in the cross. It wasn't. It was a tandem. Even though that probably was around 80 pounds for a 130-pound individual at that time, it would be really difficult. So the second question they have is this so pole or cross. They believe it's a pole, and here's their <coughs> justification. If we look at the term staros, which is the Greek word for cross, it does mean pole, stake, or beam. Saru, which is crucifixion, means just being attached to that cross. This, of all their four arguments, has the best veracity, although it's not accurate. So we do know that that saros means beam. Saru just means a fix tied to, in this case, by nails to the cross and the pole. So that is correct. But let's look at some of the data. The difficulty we have as we look at the word staros in the New Testament, and everyone is a translated what? Cross. Because it has been associated with cross for the last millennia. But the real true definition should be beam. Does that mean that he was a beam rather than a cross? Absolutely not. Stay with me. So when did the crucifixion start? It was about 500 years before <clears throat> Christ. We have this biblical figure here. The Persians were the first to do it. This individual was the first to perform that. His name is Darius I. Do you remember him and Esther? He was very much a psychopath. He crucified the first time we have in history of crucifixion over 3,000 people at one time. All of them was a T, a cross. Later, the Seleucids, remember those are the Greeks that took over. They also marriaged that in. The Carthaginians had the Romans, but the Romans were the one that perfected it. <clears throat> they took it to a height that we've never experienced before. They wanted that person to bear as much pain as humanly possible through the ordeal. It took hours for some of them to die. They wanted those executioners to be creative. That means that there was not a set pattern of crucifying individuals. Each person had their own way <clears throat> of doing it. So going back to what we had before, let's look at it from the Roman standpoint at the first century church. The individual you see at the top is Seneca the Younger. Look when he was born, four years after Christ. He was in the Roman government <clears throat> about the time when Christ was alive. He said categorically in his writings about that time that the crux compacta with the transom, the T, was the form of crucifixion. This is first century Roman literature. He also, in his writings, said there was a secondary phase. This is called the crux simplex ad infixionum, or impalement. The group that I'm mentioning here that believe that it's a stake grabbed a hold of this and said, see, it proves that it's a stake. They didn't go back in the archaeology, which is very frustrating for somebody that stays in archaeology or history, to go back and look at it and say, this refutes what is there. <clears throat> the impalement was they would take a person's hand and bind them behind the back. They would take their feet and tie them together so they would sit down with their feet in front of them. They would take a three-foot stake and drive it through their mouth down through the ground and wait for the person to die. That's impalement, not crucifixion. Totally different one. Crucifixion, a T. So that's when the, this group really brought archaeology forward and said, now that explains that the impalement means that Christ was tied to the cross like this. Categorically not. They did not go back and look at what the definition of the crux simplex was. 
So let's look at some of the patrician writers. The patrician writers call them because they were the first five centuries of church writers. Now, Justin Martyr was <clears throat> born about 70 years after Christ's death, but at the height <clears throat> excuse me, of the crucifixion. I want to take his whole quote. For the one beam is placed upright, driven in the ground, not movable, from which the highest extremity is raised up into a horn. Remember I said the horn just means a point. So it's already fixed. With the other beam is fitted what? On to it, on top of it. And the ends appear on both sides as horns joined to one of the one horn, a T. And he finishes this. And the part which is fixed in the center, sidile, which I showed you earlier, of which the suspended those who are crucified. That's where they were nailed. Obviously, the nails in the hands or probably the wrists, the ligamentous material would be better to go through. This is where they were, they were crucified. So that's why I said the feet and archaeology shows it probably were together. One more, Arrhenius, wrote also about the same thing. He was a little bit later, but also at the height of the crucifixion. Crucifixions didn't stop, like Steve said, until uh, Constantine came in about 300 AD. And so Arrhenius is writing. The very form of the cross, too, has five extremities. It means two ends tied together with two ends, and then the sidile in the beginning, in the middle. Two in length, two in breadth, and one in the middle, <clears throat> on which the person rests who is what? Fixed by the nails. Two nails. So this is where we get some of the ideas that maybe the feet were parallel rather than one on top of the other. But either way is okay. Both Justin Martyr and Aronius mentioned the seat or sidile as the fifth part. You've got to be careful with historians and especially biblical historians. This is not correct. It was not a seat. It was a place for the feet to be nailed. You wouldn't nail the hips into the cross. It would be really difficult to do. So the biblical author here was off on it. So we know that the feet or sidile was for the feet. So what structural evidence do we have to support what I'm saying to you? And if you go back through all the Roman history from before Christ, after Christ, they talked about the crux commissum. That's the T, which you see in the Persian area. There is mention also of the crux emissa. That's what we see in the cross, but not as much as what the cross, the crux uh, commissa is. So history says probably a T. Does that mean that I'm up here saying that if you have and you believe that the cross is like we see it is wrong? No, that's okay. But the historic, historians show more about the T than the cross. So looking a little more about the history of archaeology, is it a cross or the, the pole? Another argument they had, the third one was that the cross wasn't part of biblical history or Christian history until 400 years after Christ died. So the ichthyus was, that was a fish, but the cross wasn't. So therefore the cross came later, so therefore it wasn't a cross, it was a beam. That's the third argument that they have. The fourth argument is taking some of that supportive evidence I just gave you about the archeology span and some of the data on crucifixion and saying this proves it was a beam because the feet were side of the beam rather than up on the front of the beam. I'm gonna show you pictures of some of the archeology span so I can understand what's going on. This is a picture of the 1968 archeological site, the heel. You're looking at it from the front of the foot back toward the calcaneus, the heel <coughs> bone. You can see the nail went through the side. So that means the feet were parallel on the beam and it was inserted in the side. This is the picture of the newest one, 2019 in Britain. You see a little different view. They spun the foot around a little bit, put a little bit more into the side, the front side of the foot and pinned the individual to the cross there. When this came out, I'll be honest with you, there were several of their writers that got really on this and said categorically this shows that it was a beam, not a cross that Christ was on. So let's look at some of the evidence. At the same time, these three writers for this group were picking up this evidence and showing that Christ died on a beam rather than a cross. 
this individual released a, a what we call a seminal piece, a, a very uh, powerful article on uh, the data about the, uh, the starogram. Staros just is two Greek letters. Tau, T-A-U, is a T, capital T. Rho, R-H-O, is a P. I'll show you the uh, starogram in just a second. He had found a papyrus that was in Egypt. You can see that his name is Larry Weir Hurtado, Dr. Hurtado. It's the, one of the best known experts in uh, Middle English, Middle uh, read, Middle Eastern languages. Here's what he found. This papyrus down at the bottom center, you can see how the top has been magnified. You'll see a starogram there. On the right, I have placed a starogram for you to see. Starogram is a T with a P on the top. That's where we got the cross from, basically. Um, in that papyrus, it's dated before the four crucifixions that we have the evidence, so we can see it there. Also, as Dr. Hurtado said, anytime you have something new in literature, which the starogram was new, that's the first time we've seen it, you would have it explained in detail. You don't have something new and then hope everybody figures it out. So he, from his thoughts and being an expert prior to his death in November of that year, said it had to be that the starogram was probably placed in between four and five decades before this. In other words, four or five decades before even the bones were picked up. So in other words, there is data at the same time these three writers wrote about the cross being a beam that refuted the evidence they were using but they didn't go on through it. They didn't look, because why they wanted to pose an idea that their thoughts were correct. If you've heard of a Christogram, anybody heard of a Christogram? All it is is that star row, that you see the starogram with an X in the background. They put the X in. So let's look at another part that is missing from their argument. So we as the Church of Christ believe that the book, the Bible in its entirety is correct. We don't take things away. We don't add things into it. And if we look at the Bible, the Bible also tells us that that theory does not work. So where does it say that God says we shouldn't add or take away? The first he talked to Moses and he said during that Exodus in Deuteronomy 4, 2, do not add to what I command you or do not subtract from it but keep the commandments that the Lord your God that I gave you. Very succinct. No way of looking at it and saying, well, maybe a little bit over here or a little bit over here. God was very succinct. A little bit later in the same chapter of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 12, 27, 32. Whatever I command you, you shall not, can you read? You should be careful, but whatever. My eyes are not even uh, focusing. But don't add or take away. It's interesting that add a little bit about anything in here. Solomon, Proverbs, do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and you will be proven a liar. Categorically, don't do it. Now you might come back and say, well, Jack, we're a New Testament church. These are Old Testament scriptures. It doesn't apply to us today. Well, yes, it does. Let's look at Revelation, the very last chapter of John's Revelation, or one of the last chapters. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this scroll. If anyone adds what? Anything to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this scroll. Remember what Glenn talked about? Revelation and the plagues, not a place to go not an experience to have. So we'll add to that. And if anyone takes words away from the scroll of prophecy, God will take away from that person his share of the tree of life and the holy city. What's that? That's heaven. So you get the plagues, which are not fun, but you also don't get in heaven. Categorically, don't take away, don't add. So why am I bringing this up to you? Because they do take away. They take away from what the Bible is to prove the point about the the beam. 
An important or significant part of that is going back to the prophecies. We have over 200 prophecies. Some said about 290 prophecies. That means in the Old Testament, it's written that something's going to happen that Jesus is going to fulfill later, and we have in the New Testament where it was fulfilled. So what about this do we have? This Psalm is 34, 19 through 20. Oops, wrong way. The afflictions of the righteous are many. Here it is about Christ. But the Lord rescues him, Jesus, from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Not one broken. Remember I told you about the, showed you the picture of the snake going through? Look at this word broken. It's uh, shabar in Hebrew. You realize that that word expands from a crack, a hole, to crushed. Anything along that spectrum, it's broken. Sending a nail through the heel, broken. So let's look at the, the New Testament and see what word we have there. So if that's the case, we should not see that one of the bones is broken in Jesus' body, and especially not through the calcaneus or the heel. This is a better rendition of what we have with the sidile and the feet. This one shows the two feet across and the nail being through. This is what the nail they used, and archaeologists believe happened, to the crucified individuals. Instead of going through the bone, once you pierce the bone, the structure of the foot is compromised. You can literally pull yourself away. It'd be very painful. You can pull yourself off of it. They didn't do that. They went through the side of the bone, making sure that it went to the ligamentous material so that the bones, the structure of the foot stayed there. You cannot pull yourself off. So that's archaeologists telling us the same thing we have here that we've been saying in our church. John 19, 33 through 36. This is another rendition. I appreciate Ryan reading for me. By the way, that history goes back almost 20 years of Ryan reading for me. So we got the tradition going on. But after they came to Jesus, who are they? They're, they're Roman guards. When they uh, saw that he, he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Yet one of the soldiers pierced his side and with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Again, a good estimate, at least 10 minutes after the last beat of the heart. And he who has seen this, that means John, so uh, John has seen it testify. John's testimony is true, and John knows that John is telling the truth, so that you may also believe for these things took place so that the scripture would be fulfilled. What scripture? Not a bone of his, of his shall be broken. That's an interesting Greek word also. If you look at the Greek word, it pans from a bruise of the bone, a fracture of the bone, up to the bone being crushed. So I have a question for you. The interactive session. I want everybody to raise their hands that have had a bone broken in their body. Raise your hand. How many have had a bone broken? Okay, thank you very much. Put your hands down. Those that had a hairline fracture, or as a kid we call a green stick fracture, how many have had one of those fractures? Put your hands up. The reality is that's a broken bone. Once you change or compromise the structure of the bone, the bone can't function the way it was before. Basically, those two words apply. The Greek word and also the Hebrew word shabar. There's no way the bone went through the heel. Or otherwise, our scripture's wrong. That means we're wrong. So let's get to the conclusion. I categorically believe that Jesus died on the cross. I categorically believe that none of the bones are broken. I think we see that from some of the archaeological evidence <laughs> that I did not mention. By the way, I skipped over a lot of stuff here because there's a lot of information available. If you want to ask about I'm more, more than happy to talk to you about that after services. But I believe he was on the cross. It may have been a T, but he was on the cross. It would not be important, this conversation would not be important if it was not that that act was for the propitiation of our sins. Not just the act, but what happened afterwards. 
He had to, what? Defeat death. The last hold that Satan had. He overcame that for us. As we had Greg mentioned in the communion, it was an extremely excruciating event. In fact, most archaeologists believe that Jesus wasn't even recognizable. That's how bad they beat him. He was on the cross. But he did it for us. Every one of us here. And for those even that pushed him away, he did it for them as well. We have an invitation that we use. It's a convenient time after we get through with a lesson that we ask people in the audience that maybe have not been baptized to come forward. Some of you might be a little embarrassed, and so that's okay. You ask us after we'd be more than happy to study with you or meet with you. The difficulty is we take the Bible and we say it is full. So let's look at it from a full standpoint of context. We must hear. If we don't hear, how can we understand? And then we understand we believe. We believe what? We believe that Jesus Christ was here. He died for our sins. Many people believe that's it. All you have to have is a belief. But let's take the full Bible. The Bible doesn't end there. The Bible says we must confess that Jesus is our Lord, turning from that secular side to spiritual side. If that's not the case, we're still back over in this side. So we say Jesus is our Lord, and we make Jesus our Lord. Then we repent of our sins because we're trying to get rid of that secular side, move to the spiritual side. Then the portal by which we become members of the church, is baptism, full immersion. I remember a very sad situation that happened a few years ago. We were studying with a family. Family was, uh, the parents were in their early 40s, and the three daughters, one was a senior in high school. I think it was just right in high school, and the other two, just a beautiful, beautiful family. And we baptized them, and when the older daughter came out after drying off a little bit, she came up and I gave her a hug. And she said, now I have nothing to worry about because I'm not going to do anything because I'm saved. Those five never came back to church. Never saw them again. They never received our phone calls. Sad. That's not the end. If you look back in the Bible, John said in John 14, 15, what? If you love me, you want. Keep my commandments. In other words, you flip it around. If you don't love me, you're not going to keep my commandments. That means you've discarded Christ, not accepted Christ. So anyway, we have this opportunity for you that you can come forward if you want to. Or if there's another need that you have on the outside for prayers, please take advantage of this. Or you can see us afterwards. One of us has got the badges. Come up and talk to us. Please come forward if we need any as we stand and sing.